Today we're joined by an uh, internationally renowned scholar of privacy. Helen Essenbaum is Professor of Media, Culture, and Communication and Computer Science at New York University, where she's also Director of the Information Law Institute. You can already see in that one sentence the number of subjects that are affected by her work. Uh, she has written widely in the area, and I won't uh, prolong this introduction by describing her many accolades. I will mention that she has a brand new book, which, uh, which uh, we will also have the pleasure of having her co-author for the book here actually next week. So mm -hmm. Finn Brutton will be here talking about continuing this discussion uh, next week. Um, and so she's been uh, a very important scholar and a number of books, uh, including one we discussed this morning. Uh, she was gracious enough to join us uh, in our seminar setting to discuss privacy in context. Um, so she holds a PhD in philosophy from Stanford, so she is fundamentally a philosopher, uh, even though she runs the Information Law Institute. Uh, shows you the importance of uh, the humanities to, uh, to everything that we do. And she had both a bachelor's from the University of Witchwater Square. Uh, let's welcome uh, Ms. Chesimba. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. And thank you very much, Professor Chana, because um, he and I have met each other on numerous occasions at the Privacy Law Scholars Conference and it's a real honor for me to have been invited to be part of the series and I'm, I'm sorry that I'm, I'm not here, I'm not going to meet everybody who's uh, in this group. So, let's see. One thing I should mention is that <clears throat> Finn Brunton and I are colleagues in the same department and so he and I discussed and you won't get the same lecture from him. Instead, He's going to talk to you about his new book that he's working on, and I will talk about our. Let's see. Um, I'll I'll work. I'll talk about not so much. Uh, the book is is of course an upshot of this work. I'm, I'm not sure why this is purple. I should just mention on my screen it's black. <laughs> so, if, if things happen that you can't see what's on there, we'll, we'll just. We'll just have to work on that together, that adventure. Um, so it's really about the idea behind obfuscation and why obfuscation emerged as something interesting. And what and, and from time to time I'll mention when there's stuff in the book that I'm not going to do in a lot of detail. But more than anything, I would like to um, share the ideas of the argument of obfuscation why obfuscation is an important thing from my point of view, an important way for people to resist forms of unacceptable surveillance and sometimes to use obfuscation even if not to resist, because we aren't able to resist, but at least to express protest. The, the work, as you can see, on obfuscation, and, and this is the book cover, and just to give evidence of the situation, this is what the book looks like in real life. <laughs> People that I've worked with, Finn Brunton, of course, as a collaborator of many years, looking at the historical and the philosophical and the ethical side of things, um, Daniel Howe, Vincent Tubiana, and Mushan Zarabib are computer scientists and um, computer designers who have helped and continue to help develop systems. And um, I'll introduce you to a couple of those systems and who continue to work and make them better and better. So just to step back a moment and say, how did it all happen? How did, how did we start thinking? Or how did at least I start thinking about um, obfuscation, and I'm just curious if anybody has heard about Crack Me Not, then you use Crack Me Not. Oh, a few people. Oh, that's great. Okay, so Crack Me Not sends fake queries to search engines in an, or in, in an effort to obfuscate your profile to the search engine companies. 
And what happened was I was part of a, a very large group of computer scientists who were working on a project, an interdisciplinary project, um, multi-university on uh, privacy and security technology. And just at that time, had emerged the news that the, the Department of Justice had asked Google and, and actually all of the search engine companies at the time for a lot of their query logs and a year later, after AOL had released query logs for the computer science community to conduct research, claiming that they were that they were anonymized, an enterprising New York Times reporter took that huge record and managed to re-identify a number of people on that record and wrote up a, a story. And this was more, and you know. For all sorts of reasons, triangulation, the fact that some of us, not many of us, do vanity searches and so forth. And I was at the time part of this group and I was wondering, if, because I hadn't really thought about the fact that all my search queries are being logged. So my computer science colleagues said, well, there's nothing you can do about it because in order to conduct the search, your search queries have to go to the search engine. And I kept saying, but what if I don't want them to store? I don't want them to look and study my search queries. They said, there's just nothing you can do about it. So that, I thought, no, I think there, may, there must be something you can do about it. And that's when Daniel Howe, who was a PhD student in computer science, and, and I started working. We created Track Me Not, which, as you can see, sends their queries to the search companies that now has expanded. It's, it's Almost 10 years later, Vincent Tubiana, who is also a computer scientist, works at the French Data Authority Camille in Paris, um, has expanded it. You can now install it, for example, in any search bar. So if you don't want Amazon to be keeping a profile on you, then you can do it too. Anyway, after we uh, created Tracking Out, I was super proud of it. And, and when I was running around in the I, I was I just couldn't wait to tell people about Tracking Out. And so I went around giving talks, and I got a lot of um, people saying, oh, wow, that's so cool. But then a lot of people criticized, and they said, that's unethical. You're lying. You're, you're polluting the data stream, and so forth. And so all of a sudden, I thought, oh, my goodness, what? I, I didn't expect that at all. I, there's obviously something I'm missing, and I came back to NYU. And that's when Finn and I started talking. We started thinking about it. What is tracking? Why are people, at least some people, responding in this way, telling me or telling us that we're doing something unethical and immoral? And, and Finn, who is a historian, a cultural historian of science and technology, was, you know, he, he, he with him, we started understanding that tracking art was a form of resistance that we labeled obfuscation. And he, and here I learned so much, explored and suddenly revealed many, many um, obfuscating activities, not only in the realm of information and data, but all over. And the first one that um, he, we found, and that he identified, and this is an actual photo, was, um, the use of um, little pieces of aluminum foil cut to a very specific size, that with black paper, that would be utilized by the Allied fighters in World War II as they're flying over and the Germans are watching them on the radar screen, one little phosphor dot on the radar screen, and all of a sudden, hundreds of dots on the radar screen. Just for a few minutes, the bomb is dropped and the plane flies off. And of course, then these little bits of aluminum fall to the ground. Radar chaff, um, thus, is a form of obfuscation. We found obfuscation in the natural world. Here is an orb weaver spider, and, and this, this, I'm really sorry that you can't see this very clearly. This is the real spider. And this is what the orbit does. It creates stuff, and it creates little blobs that look a lot like itself. And when, the, and when wasps fly by, they, 
are flying by and they see what they think is the spider, but it's actually this decoy. And evidently, there are biologists who study this, and they say that the orb-weed spider is um, able to raise its chances by 40%. Of course, if you want to hide some document, we're better to hide it but in loads and loads of paper. The Kratos robber did the same thing. He robbed a bank. At, at that time, he advertised um, to, on Kratos for people to join him at a very specific time, wearing a very specific outfit. And as he came running up the bank, all of these people who looked exactly like him were standing there. And um, eventually, he was found and shot and killed. But anyway, this was. <laughs> And here's another example that some of us may be familiar of, the use of obfuscation. So what is this thing to the about obfuscation? The, the idea here is that we're not in a position to hide ourselves. We cannot keep the information or ourselves out of sight, as with the old weak spider. We have to be evident. So how do we protect ourselves? We protect ourselves by adding a lot of noise, by, by having too much information out there. And um, I was trying to distinguish these two different, different strategies, different tactics for protecting privacy or um, uh, hiding ourselves. And at the time, I was working with two PhD students in computer science at NYU. They were very interested in a way to, to hide your photographs, say for instance you post photographs to Facebook, now they have the ways of um, you can, you can, um, oh, that's the right word, uh, scramble your, uh, yeah, scramble your photographs for the, for the viewers, for third party viewers, but how do you scramble your photographs that even Facebook or even the server is not able to see the photographs? And they worked on something called cryptogram. So what happens here is that that's what the photo looks like to the server. And that's one way of protecting privacy. But how does it work with obfuscation? Like this. So this is the definition that we settled on at, uh, when we were writing our first paper in First Monday in 2011. It's the production, inclusion, addition, or communication of misleading, ambiguous, or false data in an effort to evade, distract, or confuse data gatherers and diminish the reliability and value of data aggregations. That is the definition. So although the term obfuscation is used in a, different, in a variety of ways, this was the particular way of resisting and protesting that we were interested to explore, it characterized track me not and many other instances, not only in regard to information. And now to get to the question that had started the whole conversation in the first place is can it be defended on moral and political grounds? Is there something, is there a problem that with obfuscation and if so, what is it and can it be mitigated? And this was something I had been very concerned about. And what we see over here are many of the critiques of obfuscation that I had heard when I went around talking about tracking art. It deceives. It's, of course, it lies. It's, it's issuing searches to the search engine that are not ones that you actually <coughs> issued yourself. It free rides on your peers because maybe you can get away with doing it because other people are you know, following the rules or maybe it free rides on the services. It, people would say it wastes bandwidth, it pollutes the data streams, it might even damage a system. Now, the, it's, it's, it's a, in order to take this argument all the way through, I won't have time to do it in the time that I have today. And so I want to take you through just some parts, the steps in the argument, and then highlight particular instances of, of the argument. And 
and then, you know, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for discussion at the end, and um, you can let me know how persuasive I've been. Um, so just, just to connect this a little bit with the book, the, the first part of the book, if you're interested in the specific, the many, many systems of obfuscation, both just out there, and also information or data obfuscation, and we list many in the book, including Crack Me Not, and several others that other people have developed and are available, and some of them are available merely as academic papers, and some of them are, are actually um, ongoing systems. So if you're confronting these kinds of ethical challenges, the first thing you want to be able to argue is that the ends are just. So in order for us, in order for me to justify or to defend crack me not, or any system of obfuscation, we have to argue, just to begin, that the ends are just, that, they, that they, the ends themselves are moral. And here, in the case of crack me not, this was to elude profiling and surveillance. But you might say that the Craigslist robber, although you might think, oh, that was cute, that was clever, but I would suspect most of us in this room would say robbing a bank, hmm, not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Destroying a rival, escaping a predator, now, obfuscation is some, sometimes used, there's hardware obfuscation, and what, you, what, the, what the hardware engineers are doing, they take a chip, and they have different, um, thank you, Mom, you know, the different transistors on the chip. <laughs> if I miss silicon, and... He's the computer scientist right here. Okay, good. <laughs> I can just take your word for it. And if you want to copy the chip and you want to get the same functionality, but you know, you, you can try and reverse engineer, but sometimes what they'll do, what the hardware engineers will do, is they'll put in decoys into the process, into the chip. And so if you're simply sort of stupidly trying to manufacture exactly what you have, then you may not get the same functionality. And so obfuscation is often used sometimes also to put code that obfuscates the code in software that's performing the crucial function. You can add uh, lines of code that aren't really doing anything but might fool someone who's just trying to copy. So there are ways, and, and we could discuss, is that end just or not? Um, and there's a lot, so, so you, 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 you have to, <clears throat> Uh, so here's an example, this is one that Finn had um, found for us, is that in France people love to speed, and the police um, of course have the radar detectors as we do here, and the drivers buy these radar detectors, sorry, the, the detectors of the detectors. <laughs> and <clears throat> it beeps every time you're going past, so you know where the cops are, so you slow down. So what do the cops do? They buy a whole lot of these things, and they put them all over the roads in an effort to obfuscate. So now your car is saying, oh, there's a detector there and there and there. So, well, I mean, the very great thing is that according to for road safety is that you slow down at all these times. Is that a good use? Well we you know we have to have a discussion about it. But the ends have to be just. But as anybody who has done for example has studied utilitarian ethics would know that you also have to ask whether the means are justified. The ends could be perfectly fine, but are they justified? Are they proportionate? Is this an acceptable way to achieve the ends that you're setting out to achieve. And so this is part of the argument that we um, also had to settle on. One of the things that um, we observe, and this now really gets to the heart of a lot of the, the information or data surveillance that we're in the midst of at the moment, is that we're in, um, I believe, a, a serious imbalance 
and asymmetry. Many of us who are the data subjects, we, we don't know what data is being collected. We don't really know, I mean, all of us sitting here, or maybe some of us sitting here, have taken the trouble to read a privacy policy. And it could be a very you know, well-written privacy policy, whatever that may mean, but it's very <laughs> difficult to know what these relationships are. And um, I haven't been following my notes. We don't know very much about the back end. Sometimes we just, it's through sheer ignorance. Often it's through complexity. So if we think about targeted advertising at the moment, everywhere we go, we have ad networks, they're tracking us, they are performing analysis. The actual, the institutional back end of it is hugely complex. There's so many parties who have access to the information. Uh, they're the analytics companies, they're the data brokers, they're the people who are connecting online information with information offline and so on. So it's enormously complex. And even the parties, the, the, the website owners, let's say the New York Times, are not aware of what's going on. So there's enormous complexity and I should say sometimes there's a concerted effort to keep the information subjects in the dark. I think this is a little bit more sinister. Maybe this is what many of us reacted to when we started reading the Snowden revelations, is how much we were kept in the dark, not only because we were ignorant, but because efforts were made to keep us in the dark. Um, also, um, the, the, the way we experience, for example, the web does not clue us into what's going on. We don't realize when we go to a website that these, the different parts of the website actually come from different parties and the different parties have different policies vis-a-vis -vis the information they're able to collect from us. And Joe Turo, for example, um, some of you may know his name, he's a very well-known expert in advertising and also writes a lot about privacy. Talks of, has done a study of the language of privacy policies. That in itself is a form of obfuscation to make us not understand what is going on with information about ourselves. And then finally, and this, is, this has been revealed in work by um, Chris Hufnagel and some folks at UC Berkeley, there are non-disclosure agreements that companies actually have to sign with data brokers so that if an, if an individual would go to the company, I don't know, William Sonoma, I, I'm just, just, I'm in a law school context, I just, that's just a for example, I'm not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> but William Sonoma, if you might say, oh, how did you know the, my address? And if they've signed a non-disclosure with the data broker, they're not allowed to tell you where they got this information. So this is, this is what we call the epistemic asymmetry. And we're also working, we're functioning with, within a power asymmetry as well. Because a lot of the informational exchange takes place within the context of relationships that we, we simply cannot refuse. And it's not, well, we could refuse them, but if we want to remain part of society, in a feasible way, have a job, do shopping, uh, drive a car, live in a, an apartment or a house. I mean, these are things that are all now fundamentally information exchanges. So opting out is simply not an option. Um, we explore possibilities of law, and this is very, very slow. Vested interests are extremely strong. And as for corporate best, best practice, I think you only need to look at things like Google's federated privacy policy to see that this is the fox guarding the hen house. So we, we're in this situation and we have we prepared obfuscation um, with, we found it useful to use a concept that James C. Scott developed called um, a weapon of the weak. 
of course, this concept for him was developed when he was um, studying communities in Malaysia who were, who were, where the peasant farmers and the, some of the workers were much more, they were seriously uh, exploited, they don't, they don't necessarily have the vote and so on. So he was looking at when people lack commonly agreed upon or commonly recognized means of expressing themselves or exerting power, as we might think in this country, you, if you have the vote, if you have money, if you have guns, you can express yourself and have some power. But what do you do when you don't? And this is the idea of the weapon of the week. Things like heel dragging. Um, Gary Marx has a great paper describing various of these techniques, attacking the shoe. And we believe that track me, uh, that uh, obfuscation is this kind of weak weapon of the week. Now let's go back to tracking art for a moment. And this was this article was published less than a week ago, and it's expressing the same thing. Look at us. We're ten years later in the discussion about web search, and still worries that actually we don't know what is happening with these aggregated search queries. We're in this position of serious asymmetries. So what do we do? And this is where obfuscation can sometimes come to the rescue. The vector of impact, this is the term I've, I've been thinking about. When you don't have that direct force, when you can't go in and say, I don't want you to be collecting my search queries. What do you do? And in the case of the search, I hope you can read this. You probably can't see this. It's just, it's, 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 it's a door. It's an open door, just to let you know that. So what you know, you go to the government, you say, please pass the door. You go to the company, that thing, let's say it's Google. It's this huge corporation. How do you how do you get across to them? This is what you want. How do you get into that huge institution and have an impact? Express what you want. What do you do? There's only one thing you can do. As far as I know, there's only one way I can get the Google search engine to listen to me. And what is that? Search. You can search, right? <laughs> That is the vector of impact. If that's what you can do, that's how you get your obfuscation going. And that, in retrospect, is why we were able, just two of us, a graduate student and myself, and I don't even code, so it was just him, really, wrote the program that is tracking art. So we're back to the ethics and politics and some of the charges, those charges that were brought against Track Me Not, and you could argue against any many forms of data obfuscation. And some of the pushback, and here again, I'm, I'm, I won't have time to go into details of these arguments. So if you think about the question of waste versus use, because many people would say, oh, Track Me Not wastes bandwidth. It become, it's an ethical question because Remember, we we're saying, even if the ends are just, the means that you're using may not be just. They may not be defensible. So if you, could, if you think that the waste versus the waste argument is a good argument, what you realize, actually, is that who defines what's waste? So you live in Northern California. And we just had you have just had a big drought. What is waste? Is waste having a shower, or is it use? Is it? Let's say you have a leaky faucet and you just didn't get around to fixing it. Is that waste or is it use? What about those people in Southern California that love to have green lawns, and so they insist on watering their lawn every day so it looks green? Is that waste or is it use? Waste. <laughs> <laughs> Answer 
Asking that question is a highly political issue. You have to decide what we value, and this is a limited resource, and so are we going so that question of waste and use is a very highly charged question. And so although it might seem obvious to at least the person who challenged us to say, you're wasting bandwidth, bandwidth, the pushback we came with is that actually, if you believe that defending against profiling for your search queries, as the writer from the Atlantic was concerned about, then in fact, utilizing Although you are utilizing bandwidth, or although you know not not more than people who play World Warcraft, and I think that's a waste. But okay, that's not really part of the discussion. <laughs> it's, it's to say that protecting myself against profiling is a use. It's not a waste, and therefore this ethical question becomes a political question in these ways. And and similarly. The other one that, that is, I think, also uh, a really important one is this idea of polluting the data stream, polluting the data lake, if you will, because we have big data, and big data is going to cure disease and save the climate, and um, what else? And make cities run better and make us fit and healthy, because we're all going to, you know, engage in Internet of Things and Smart Grid and so forth. And indeed, I believe that, I mean, I believe a lot of this, but there's a sleight of hand in the argument. I'm, not conv I'm convinced that some of the data that is, that, is, uh, that is flowing from me in my interaction is being put to public use, and I'm willing to say that that's a good thing, and of course we need to put protections into it and so on, but when the data that's being collected from me is being collected by a company who's putting it to use to make more profit without taking my interest or the public interest into consideration, I'm not sure that I have an obligation to keep that data stream or the data lake, whatever you want to call it, pristine. There's, there's, there's an argument to be had here, and that's all I'm going to say about it. But it also relates to this question of whose risks and uh, what the level of confidence we should have in the risks and so forth. So um, another one of the, being, I mean, being convinced by these arguments, another, um, we developed another system, Daniel, Mushan, and I, and you can download this one too. It's called um, ad nauseum. Now, what ad nauseum does? It's 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 pushing back against the tra tracking of people as as we venture on the web, going from website to website, because we know that there's this back end, and many of the large ad networks can track us all across the web. And uh, one of the ways, one of their vectors of impact is the ads that we click. And what ad nauseum does is it clicks on every ad. <laughs> so, I'm gonna do this so much. I sort of lost track of, okay, I have a little bit of time. So I can, um, I want I'll try and come back to this. I thought I had installed a link here. Okay. Anyway, this is this is um, we're very proud of this. It's been functioning for about a year, and you can download it for free. It's open code. It's open source, and so forth. Now, aside, the, this is the ethical discussion, and aside from that. Um, the question is, does obfuscation work? And this was a critique that we got from many computer scientists who, who cared with us. They believed in the same principles, but they were concerned that data obfuscation doesn't work. 
And so it, this was an, an interesting um, discussion for us to have. But many of these were cryptographers who thought that it would be very easy to reverse engineer or to use machine learning to throw out the bad, um, the, the, the misleading information. And this, this, uh, this is what obfuscation does, by the way. And when we confronted those kinds of criticisms, we realized something else that's general about obfuscation. And that is that obfuscation, and here I'm coming back to this weapon of the weak, but now I'm focusing on the part where I say it's, it's, a, it's weak, but what do I mean by weak? It doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't get things done, but it's highly contingent. And obfuscation as a strategy or as a tactic <coughs> needs to be extremely matched, well matched, to the specific problem that it's trying to solve. It's a highly contingent response. It's not a one size fits all. And so when we were going through the many obfuscating systems that we had studied and relocated, we could see that they were all, many of them were, that they clung together under different goals. Some of them were to buy time. So the, the clearest example of that would be the, the radar chaff, which is all you need is maybe 10 minutes to drop the payload and go. That's all you need. Now, a, a cryptographer might want many, many years on a huge machine to be able to decrypt something when the key is such and such a length. But for, for obfuscation, <coughs> if it's buying time, you only need to buy the amount of time that you need. And so you need to do that. Sometimes it's to provide cover. Uh, many people thought that Track Me Not could be used to provide deniability. So there were at the beginning, people would write to us with different complaints. They would say, why are you issuing these namby-pamby search queries when what you really want to do is provide cover for people who are interested in looking at for sensitive information? Then we would add a few bad terms into the mix, and they would come back to us and say, why are you doing that? I'm sure that if I use tracking up, the NSA is going to be onto me in no time. And we realized, you know, uh, what are we trying to do with Crack Me Not? Because it's clear we couldn't satisfy everyone. We ha actually have a, a, um, a compromise at the moment, which is people can choose an RSS feed, and, and so you can have some, some say in it. But uh, we, we had to make choices on, as to which of these goals to enter. And, and but for myself, I was most interested with interfering with profiling, and that's also the purpose that ad nauseum serves. Early on, we decided this is not going to be the tool. If you want to um, hide your identity, you should use Tor or a different mechanism, but, uh, because Track Me Now is not going to allow you to do that. And sometimes you don't care, you just want to express protest. So, um, and th this now gets to another dimension of thinking about the different forms of obfuscating systems because we recognize some of them uh, are done by individuals some need a collective so loyalty card swapping people had to get together in a group and swap their loyalty cards do we want the obfuscation to be seen or not seen do we want say with with tracking not do we want to fly under the radar, so to speak, or do we care that Google or the search or Baidu or the search engines know that we're obfuscating? Sometimes if we want to be protesting, then we want them to know that we are, and so on. How selective or general, short-term, long-term, and so these are the different dimensions of obfuscation, knowing that it's highly contingent. And, and this is my last slide, um, because if we've come to the conclusion, as we have, that obfuscation is an important strategy or tactic for the individual to perform, to protest, to resist, where the other options are not available, law, corporate, best practice, and so forth, what do we need to do? Because it might seem that something like Track Me Not can be done no matter what. But in fact, 
the possibility of obfuscating itself is quite contingent. So first of all, we're very interested in thinking through some of the statistical challenges, the science and engineering of obfuscation, also understanding the politics and the social scientific dimension. There's a lot of work that needs to do to, uh, to understand the threat models. What are the problems, you could say this, what are the problems or what are the questions that obfuscation is the right answer for? Because it isn't the only way and often obfuscation will not achieve your end. And so you're often in situations where if you're after privacy or um, resistance to surveillance, then obfuscation is not going to achieve that. So we need to understand the threat models. We need to have more research and system development so that we can create lots and lots. And with the, in, with the internet of things coming our way, there is there are going to be hundreds of opportunities to utilize obfuscation to this end. The fact that we had open protocols that we were able to access Firefox and Chrome, we were not able to access Safari, is something we need. We need, and those things don't happen automatically. This is a matter of technology policy, and these are ways we need to safeguard the possibility. And finally, we need law that helps us to limit the enforcement of certain terms of service. And you can think of things like Facebook's real name policy. Google, for example, has a policy against automated access of the services. So in principle, they could come after people who are using crap or not and say, can't you see you violating the terms of service? And so legal questions, policy questions about how enforceable the terms of service are, are going to be very relevant to the possibility of utilizing and developing obfuscation. And I hope that there'll be people who will take us up and, and work on the various dimensions um, as we proceed. Thank you.